What's up guys, Mike here from Ecom Knives, and I'm back with a FAQ series, FAQ number four. Now for you guys that are brand new and haven't, uh, haven't seen this before, just joining the channel, uh, this is the series where you guys ask knife making questions and I answer them to the best of my ability. If I don't know the answer, I'll let you know. <laughs> if I do know the answer, or based on my limited experience, I've been doing this a couple of years now, I'll do my best to answer them for you and point you in the right direction. This is beginner friendly guys, there is no such thing as a stupid question, so when I go to do this once a month, put your questions down below. These videos are the first place I look for questions for the FAQ series. Now before we get started, I also want to say thank you very much for the huge pouring of support for the folder series, which uh, we're up to part two now, uh, where we're going to make a folder, a uh, frame lock flipper to be specific. Uh, and I know you guys wanted to see another one of those this week, but I ran into a little trouble at work, as you can see here. That truck that broke down in July broke down again, and I lost a day of work. Uh, plus, I was waiting on the heat treat, but if you look right back there, guess what showed up yesterday? <laughs> so we are back in business, guys. The folder series will continue very shortly. Okay, now on to the FAQs. Mosquito in here already, it's not even dark out yet. Okay, Steve Walker. It says, uh, "What grit would you use for a satin finish?" I cannot find an, I cannot get an even uniform uh, mark that looks good. It doesn't look professional. Okay, Steve. I think what you're speaking about is the belt finish, right? So, the satin finish. It's the vertical lines on a blade that comes straight off the grinder, and it has that nice uniform pattern, which is very appealing. Uh, hand finishing is totally different. I'm pretty sure he's talking about belt finishing. Uh, and you can see a little bit of it here on the top swedge of this knife. You see that that's a satin, not the bottom, the top. That's a satin. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, the best advice, and I struggled with this a lot as well when I started, the best advice I can give you is start with a perfect foundation, which means I know that sounds a little ridiculous and just weird, but if you're going to do a flat grind, make that flat grind perfectly flat. If you're going to do a hollow grind, make it perfectly hollow. Uh, any facets or, or waves in the grind will show up. It doesn't matter what you use to finish the knife. All it's going to do is highlight those and make it that uneven finish. Then you get into pressure, so you're going to have to do everything evenly. Start with your your perfect foundation and if, if you've gotten that far then you want to move up to something like a finishing belt like we have these cork belts here uh, this is, happens to be a 600 grit uh, I believe I got these from uh, truegrit.com or USA Knife Maker one of those I forget which one but I think both of them have it this one happens to be a 600 grit so I'd work my way from uh, 120, 220, 400 and then the 600 and I would finish with that belt. So when you get those finishing belts, and now the cork belts aren't the only ones, they have Trizax, there's uh, Scotch Brights, and experiment. It's, I've had the best luck with the cork belts, thanks to Steve Miller who recommended them. Uh, but a lot of guys like the Trizac belts, the Scotch Bright belts. So anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. So you've got your knife and you're grinding away. You want to have a quick, nice, easy pass. Uh, not a ton of pressure, and you want even pressure across the entire length of the blade. So you, when you get in there, just start the edge, full pass, and you will get a nice satin finish. Uh, it'll be much, much better than uh, just kind of piecing it together or not using a finishing belt. It can be done the other way, uh, but it's a lot harder. So try the finishing belts. Let me know how it works out for you. Okay, next question. We got Cal Zachary. Uh, what is your preferred stainless steel? Okay guys, uh, this one's easy. As of right now, and I've used a number of stainless steels now, as of right now, my favorite is CPM 154. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it is one of the easiest steels to work with. Uh, which means it's very knife making friendly. Uh, number two is it's a nice mid-range steel that has all excellent properties. It's not a super steel, 
by any stretch, and it's not a bottom end steel. So as far as value goes to the end user, to whoever's going to buy that knife from you, it's a good steel, a good all around steel that you really can't go wrong with. The stainless properties are great, the edge retention, the ease of sharpening is all great. Now as far as a maker's standpoint, it's very easy on us as well. So it's easy to sand, it's easy to shape, it's easy to grind. Uh, if you want to do a, a, a polished bevel like this, that's the steel you use. This happens to be AEBL, by the way. Uh, a lot of guys love that. Mm, it's okay. Uh, for the user, it's excellent. For the maker, eh. I like the CPM 154 better. Der Kaffee Man 123. Uh, Timo from Germany. Uh, he wants to know, and it's, it's a big long question, but I'm going to kind of paraphrase it for him. Uh, he's in Europe and he has uh, he, he's looking for a bandsaw what do I use to cut metal and stuff like that uh, now I use a porta band but he puts over here that he knows a lot of makers are using the Milwaukee porta bands which around here is about a $300 saw uh, with the blades that come with it <clears throat> and they clamp it in the vise and which is what I do uh, so he's looking for somebody on a, uh, something on a budget and he, he says in Europe that these porta band saws are crazy expensive so what are his options as far as getting a bandsaw, something to cut his material with? Now, I'll pick you up, I'll take you on a little road trip. Now, I don't have the Milwaukee brand, I have the Harbor Freight band, a brand, which is the, uh, sorry, I'm hanging belts all over it, uh, Central Pneumatic or whatever it is, Chicago Electric, it's some Chinese off-brand. And the same thing, I have it, oh, I guess I'll show you again. It's clamped in a vise, as you guys can see. Now, I was able, if you guys are in the States, I got that from Harbor Freight. Oh, sorry about the shaking there. Put you down. If you guys are in the States, I got that from Harbor Freight for 100 bucks, And excellent bang for the buck. It's going strong for two years now. As far as blades, I use the Milwaukee 18 TPI blades. They're not the best. And one of you guys, uh, a, a, a viewer, emailed me and said, you have to try these Lennox bimetal blades. I haven't bought any yet because I have a stash of Milwaukee blades in the back. But once those are gone, I'm going to try out these Lennox blades. Now, he also goes on to say, since porta bands are terribly expensive over there, if he got a, one of the giant uh, Chinese saws, Let's see, the China made stationary band saws and just throw away the whole foot. He's talking about these big saws that come down like this and it's kind of like, like on an L and they come down and do straight cuts only. Uh, a lot, I've seen guys that put a saddle on this part of the saw and just kind of sit there on the saw and do their cutting and shaping that way. Uh, the Chinese saws, while they're not the best quality and I'm sure they're not going to last forever, uh, every once in a while, I get a little hiccup with mine, but for the price and the two years I got out of it, I can't complain. Uh, so it's basically get something that's going to have a slow moving 18 to 24 TPI blade, uh, bimetal, and then go from there. Louis Lavenda, uh, would you ever consider making a ballast song? Uh, yes, I have considered it, uh, but I haven't acted on it just yet because I have the the frame lock project going on and and everything like that plus uh, trying to get my name out there I'm working on fixed blades and, and learning myself really I haven't gotten there yet now as cool as ballast songs are or butterfly knives or whatever the terminology is for them I don't know a whole lot about them uh, I don't know how to use one I'm, I'm not one of those guys that can do those crazy tricks and everything and I, I'm in awe when I see somebody that can that's, that must take some serious skill. Uh, but one day I'm going to talk to some of these people and kind of get some feedback and information on, hey, what would make a great ballet song? And then try and make it from there. Uh, Wide Vision Metal Fab asks, are you still happy with your Grizzly Mill? Any problems with it? Well, for knife making, the Grizzly Mill is okay. I don't want to say it's excellent, or perfect by any stretch, but for the price, it's, get, it's again, it's like the bandsaw. 
you know, I could have bought an American made, whatever, or I don't probably not even American made, but a better quality saw for I guess 300 bucks, or I can get the cheapy saw for 100 bucks. They both cut stuff. The other one's probably going to last longer and be a little more precise. Right, and that's the, the the same thing with the mills. Uh, you kind of get what you pay for, guys. So a grizzly mill, the milling machine over there, it's a uh, cost about a thousand bucks or whatever it was, uh, and it works good, good enough to get the job done. But the more I learn, and I'm no machinist, but the more I learn about machining and tolerances and, and the tighter I want to make these joints or pivots or whatever, uh, to get everything aligned properly, the more I think, uh, maybe I should have bought a better mill. Maybe I should have bought something a little bigger. You know, I, I feel as if I'm outgrowing it. Now, if you're just starting, uh, by all means, get the Grizzly. It, it works fine. And you'll get really far with it. But if I could do it again, or if I could recommend something to you guys, if you're going to go manual mills only, no CNC or anything, uh, get the biggest, heaviest mill you can afford. In all honesty. Now, I didn't have the room. I remember I was in the little tin shed when I bought it. I didn't have the room. I didn't have the power. I didn't have the budget to buy something big and crazy. So, even the Grizzly was kind of pushing it. You really have to spend some time tramming it. It, don't expect it to come uh, out of the crate uh, perfectly trammed and in and, and check. And I didn't know this when I first got it. I didn't even know what tramming was. So, is it good? Yes. Will it, will it take you far in knife making? Absolutely. Is it perfect? No. By no stretch. And I didn't expect it to be. Uh, with as lightweight as it is for a milling machine, uh, you don't get the best surface finish, and you ha kind of have to baby it. So don't expect to take huge, heavy cuts out, out of material and leave a mirror finish. It's just not going to happen with this mill. Uh, but if you baby it along and kind of go easy on it, it'll do everything you need to do for knife making on a manual milling machine. I will say this. The best upgrade that I have bought for that mill, by far, absolutely by far, is a digital readout. And it doesn't have to be one of these glass scale, super duper expensive ones uh, that cost more than the mill itself. But I got that $200 eye gauging set, and I swear by it, I, if it broke, I would buy another one tomorrow. I'm sure it's not perfect, it's not 100% accurate, but it's a lot better than sitting there reading dials or trying to guesstimate how far you are on that mill. Sorry about that, guys, I had to stop and get a, get a drink. It's really hot in here. Let's see. What do we got? Uh, 94 degrees. I need a windshield wiper or something. <laughs> Jack Relstab. Hey Mike, I'm 14, so my knife budget is basically what I can sell, which isn't very much because I'm still learning. Do you have any tips for how I can save on stuff like belts, handle material, uh, uh, etc.? Also, thanks for the vids. Well, thank you. All right, Jack, well, the best thing I could tell you for that is stick to the basics. So don't go out and buy a... So I'll give you an idea. Let's see if we got some prices on this stuff. Okay, so we got a big sheet of G10. Look at the price on that. What is that? 23 bucks for quarter inch G10 and a nice big sheet. As you see, I cut some scales out of it already. And that same sheet, even smaller in size for carbon fiber is, look at the price tag on that. So 93 bucks, quite a difference. So my advice to you, oh, even then, before we get into that, here's some Kieranite scales. These are about 25 bucks a piece. Uh, well, 25 for the set. Expensive. My advice to you, stick with G10 or cheaper woods or something like that, whatever your style is and your preference, and stick with cheaper steels and work on selling your skill rather than the materials. So. If you wanted to make some knife that's, think of, it, think of it this way, would you rather buy a poorly finished knife in carbon fiber or a excellently uh, finished, excellently? A very well finished knife in G10. I don't know about you guys, but I'll take the G10 with the skill any day. So to keep your costs low, I would say keep your material cost low and focus on progressing your skill level, right? People, knife making is funny in the sense that you need to build a name and prove yourself before people are knocking down your door to buy your stuff. And it takes time. While you're waiting, while you're doing and you're progressing and learning and proving yourself, 
work on the basics with cheap material. Get yourself some 1084. It's uh, you know, a, a four foot bar for 20 bucks or a, a, and a sheet of just plain old black G10. You don't have to do some Anzo pattern nonsense or, or rock patterns or all this stuff. Just focus on perfect finishing. Spend the extra time and hand finish those knives. Get that perfect satin finish and people will go, wow, that's excellent work. I want one. That's how you do it. Get out of here, Gypsy Moth. Alfonso Terones? Ter I'm sorry if I butchered that. Alfonso. Uh, Mike, recently you found your videos and you have proven helpful with even with my razor making. So I appreciate the time you put into making the videos. Oh, thank you, Alfonso. Uh, my question is related to the mirror polish. I actually have no problem getting steel to polish up to a mirror shine. Uh, but how do you keep the crisps crisp grind lines and that's why this knife is out here because I knew that question was coming so he can get this finish but he's having trouble getting this the nice crispy lines right so if this is a hollow grind and I think that's what he was referring to is the hollow grind polish and there is a trick to it and it's uh, it's all in the forget about the the buffing wheels right don't use the buffing wheel until you've sanded this to 2500 grit Right, from from nothing. So if if you ground this out with a 220 grit belt, go back to 120, get a perfect foundation on the wheel, and then progress up to 220, 400, 600, 800, 1200, 2000, 2500, and then buff it. Okay. Uh, now, how do you get that sanded finish? You could do something like. My buddy made me this, and I grind on a 12-inch wheel. So this is for a 12-inch diameter wheel. There I am, Mike. And as you notice, that is the contour of a 12-inch wheel. So I can get in those hollows, like this, and hand sand it like this. If you don't have a fancy block like this, you could just do it where you ground it. Turn off the machine. Right? So. I actually have a wheel in there. Let's go check it out. All right. Oh, it's dark over here. Let's get some sandpaper. And see, we have our 12-inch wheel. Turn the machine off. Right? Uh, there's no belt hooked up or anything. Lay some sandpaper on the wheel and just sand it like that. That's how I do it. I think uh, Brad Southerd did that one time on an Instagram video or something like that. And I said, I can't believe I never thought of that. So, all right, this is going to be, as always, a end of part one. We're going to have to do a part two for this, guys. Uh, so that's it. I'll cut this out here, and we'll pick up the rest of them at part two.